So, that's the end of that section. The second section is a reading of Matthew 5. So I'm going to begin in verse 1. Seeing the multitudes, he went up onto the mountain. When he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people reproach you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right. So, let's see what my points are. Out of all the types of people who are blessed, according to Jesus, how are they similar? Some may say that all of those who are blessed, according to these verses, are blessed because of their character. For example, blessed are you when people reproach you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So, in this example, then... Um, you are blessed because of your character. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was getting lost there. All right. Um, some would say that this verse is talking about being blessed because of righteousness, not about being blessed because of persecution. So basically, um, those people who take that view about this section would say that you are blessed when people reproach you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for Jesus' sake, because not because of because you're reproached, persecuted, and falsely accused of evil things, but because um, you are righteous. And these things are happening to you. You are reproached, persecuted, and all kinds of evil things are said against you falsely for Jesus' sake because you're righteous. So they would say it's not so much what happens to you that makes you blessed, like being reproached, persecuted, and all kinds of evil things being said against you. It's um, that you're righteous, and, and because you're righteous, then that stuff happens. So, in another verse, blessed are those who mourn could be referring to those who mourn because of some kind of wickedness, either mourning because an evil action was done to them, or mourning because of wickedness in general. So a righteous person is blessed who mourns because uh, a righteous person would mourn about evil. That's that view. Others believe that there are two types of people Jesus said are blessed. Those who are blessed because of their character. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So those who hunger and thirst after righteousness are those who really, really want uh, righteousness in the world, in their own lives, in just in general. That would be a character trait. And those who are rewarded because of their faithfulness. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake. So the people who take this view, um, who believe that Jesus was talking about two types of people, not just one, uh, would believe that this verse is talking about those who are rewarded because of their faithfulness. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake. So they're blessed because, not because they're persecuted, but they are because they're going to be rewarded for their faithfulness in the persecution. So, and by the way, I, I tend to believe that this is more accurate. I was looking at it to try and figure out which one, and I think this one's more accurate, in my opinion. So, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its flavor, with what will it be salted? It is then good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do you light a lamp and put it under a measuring basket, but on a stand, and it shines to all who are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So my question is, who is Jesus talking to in these verses? 
Many times people treat verses 13 through 16 as if Jesus was talking to modern day Christians. Verses 1 and 2 says that Jesus was teaching a multitude. Let me go back up. Seeing the multitudes, he went up on, onto the mountain. When he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, And Matthew chapter 4, verse 25, the final verse in chapter 4 says, and I'm not going to go there, I'm just going to quote this, Great multitudes from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan followed him. So, he wasn't talking to modern-day Christians. He had an audience in front of him, and he was talking to a multitude which consisted of those from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. We can safely assume there were Jews there, and possibly Samaritans and others as well. So, why did Jesus say, you are the light of the world, a city located on a hill can't be hidden? Speaking to all of these different people from different regions. I don't think he said what he said in verse 14 simply because these people came to him. I think he said this because many of his listeners were Jews who were God's chosen people, and many of them, whether they were Jews or not, knew the law of Moses. This is implied later on in this chapter and especially knew who Jehovah was. This doesn't mean these verses don't apply to us. This just means he didn't say them directly to us. That's my main point. They still can apply, but um, he wasn't speaking directly to us, so to act like he was is, you know, I don't know. I, I It frustrates me sometimes when people do that, but that's just me. I know other people think differently. All right, 17 through 20. Don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. For most certainly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the law, until all things are accomplished. Whoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and teach others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, and Pharisees, there is no way you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And um, let's see. It says "u me" in Greek. That would be "u" and "me," which means "not, not," or like it says here, uh, "there is no way," or "certainly not." You will certainly not enter into the kingdom of heaven. All right, so um, verses 17 through 20 introduce the rest of Jesus' dialogue in verses 21 through 48. So basically, uh, 17 through 20 says, Don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Um, in the rest of this chapter, he's basically just talking about the law. Uh, knowing this will help us to understand what he says in those verses, so verses 21 through 48. So those verses are talking about the law, and uh, you might that might be obvious to you when you just read it, but at the same time, it might just pass over your head. So it's I, I think it passed over my head the first time I read it. People tend to explicitly misuse verse 18. So it says, For most certainly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Many authors who do this leave out the words at the end of the verse, which say, from the law until all things are accomplished. They use this verse to back up the claim that nothing in scripture could have been changed. So they say, um, well, yeah, that nothing in scripture could have been changed. So they say that... Um, that not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke could have been changed in scripture or their claim or they use it to back up their claim that scripture is without error now i'm not necessarily disagreeing with what they're saying i do not believe that scripture contains errors but i do believe that the text can contain errors but that's a different subject i just wanted to clarify because i didn't want anyone thinking that I don't believe in, uh, you know, uh, 
I didn't I didn't want anyone to think that I thought that scripture is can have errors in it. But anyways. So um, whether what they claim is true or not, they are still misusing scripture. I guess that kind of explains it. Notice what it's, that it says, not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the law. They say they use it to back up the claim that nothing in scripture, scripture could have been changed. Or they use it to back up the claim that scripture is without error. But it says... Not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the law. It's not talking about scripture completely. Scripture would be all of the Bible. The law is a portion of the Bible. Jesus is specifically specifically talking about the law in this verse, not all of scripture. The law would be Genesis, Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. That would be the Jewish law, the Torah. And that's what Jesus says. Not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Notice that it says until all things are accomplished. The all things Jesus is talking about are the prophecies contained in the law, contained in Genesis, Exodus, and so on. And the prophecies contained in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so on. Specifically, he's talking about the prophecies concerning himself. Verse 17 says, Don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, accomplish, to complete. Uh, the Greek word is uh, pleuro, which means to fill in general. It can mean like fill completely or, well, you know, to fill. If you fill, something is full. That's what it means. It means to fill. But um, as far as prophecies are concerned, it's used constantly that I've seen. It's used constantly. The word pleuro is used, they say, to fill the scriptures or to fulfill the prophecies. And so it basically just means when it as far as uh, fulfilling the prophecies, they mean to complete, to accomplish. The prophecies prophesied something and... Um, if they're prophesying about Jesus, that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. He completed what they said he would do, if that makes any sense. All right, so verses 21 through 48. So, well, let me, um, I just want to make sure that you understand. Basically, what I'm saying is, is um, it frustrates me that a lot of people misuse this, even when they have good intentions, even if what they're saying is true. Even if they're right, they still misuse it, and it, I don't know why they do that. I mean, why do they have to use scripture to uh, prove what they're saying if it doesn't really prove what they're saying? That's, that's misusing it. Um, and they make it sound like this verse is talking about all of scripture, and it's only talking about the law. And some people talk, use this verse to say that that scripture cannot be altered. So in other words, um, they say one smallest letter, one tiny pen stroke. They say that that means that there can be no variation. Like for example, say one scholar, if it was in English, accidentally turned the F into an H because um, you know this F kind of looks like a capital H. So it said whore. Well, certainly that doesn't make any sense, but that's a possibility. I believe that happened. Um, in my opinion, it's pretty obvious that that has happened a lot, but um, through uh, textual analysis, we've come pretty close to what it really said and gotten rid of all that stuff. But uh, So it's, it's pretty clean from what you're reading, but I do believe that that could have happened and that has happened. Some people use this verse and say that no, it couldn't have happened because not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the dot 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 scripture when it says law. So that's that's my uh, complaint. All right, so 21 through 48. I'm just going to read the whole thing and then I'll go back over it. That's a lot of verses. You've heard that it was said to the ancient ones, you shall not murder. And whoever shall murder shall be in danger of the judgment. But I tell you, 
that every one who is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, and who, whoever shall say, You fool, shall be in danger of the, file, of the fire of Gehenna. If therefore you are offering your if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has anything against you, leave your gift before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are with him on the way, lest perhaps the prosecutor deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be cast into prison. I just want to say one short thing. Obviously, agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way, or with him on the way. That's talking about if someone has anything against you. If uh, he wants you to be prosecuted, because this makes it pretty clear, lest perhaps a prosecutor deliver you to the judge, and the judge, so if someone's trying to sue you and you're walking with them to court, then it's a lot better for you if you settle it there instead of um, just going and then the prosecutor delivering you to the judge and the judge deliver delivering you to the officer and you be casting into prison. Of course, lawsuits, you don't get cast into prison, but you see what I'm saying. Most certainly, I tell you, you shall by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. That explains it pretty much. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who gazes at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, and throw it away from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be put to be cast into Gehenna. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cast it off, or cut it off, and throw it away from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into Gehenna. It was also said, Whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorce. But I tell you that whoever puts away his wife, except for the cause of sexual immorality, makes her an adulteress, and whoever marries her when she is put away commits adultery. Again, you have heard, you have heard that it was said to them of old time, You shall not make false vows, but shall perform to the Lord your vows. But I tell you, don't swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall you swear by your head, for you, can, for you can't make one hair white or black, but, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Whatever is more than these is of the evil one. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist him who is evil, but whoever strikes you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. <coughs> Sorry for coughing in your ear. If anyone sues you to take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and don't turn away from him who desires to borrow from you. And don't turn away him who desires to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you, that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? So modern day you might say don't even the irs people the people in the irs do that yeah in um ancient times in jerusalem uh the jews i'll explain that irs isn't a good example um the jews did not like tax collectors because the tax collectors collected taxes for rome rome was over the jews and they didn't like rome very much so if you were a tax collector they kind of viewed you as someone working for the enemy so that's why he's saying uh, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. If you only greet your friends, what more do you do than others? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right. So, in general, 
Jesus isn't adding any new commandments to the law. He's clarifying the law to show how righteous a person must be to enter into heaven. Verse 20 says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, there is no way you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus isn't necessarily, in general, he's not adding new laws to the law. He's just clarifying it. That's what I mean by that. When he says, give, give to him who asks you and don't turn away him who desires to borrow from you. He's not adding this to the law. He's just clarifying what the law already says in general. In some cases he might be adding to the law. I'm not sure. I'd have to, you have to kind of look at each particular case. Right now I'm speaking in general. Also, Jesus probably isn't talking about how someone who has accepted his sacrifice can get to heaven. What I mean by that is, when he says, give to him who asks you, and don't turn away him who desires to borrow from you, that's, Jesus isn't saying that if you don't do this, which this, by the way, is a command, um, let's see, this, vivu, which is give, it's a command. In English, it's also a command. Give to him who asks you. Don't turn away from him who, borrow, who uh, desires to borrow from you. But, it's not, he's not talking to people who have already accepted, who have already accepted his sacrifice um, and can get uh, to get to heaven. Oh, yeah. I don't think that's supposed to be there. Well, anyways, who has accepted his sacrifice and can go to heaven? He's talking to people in general. Remember, he's talking to, let's see. Um, well, he's talking to the, the crowd that was in front of him. None of them had accepted his sacrifice, at least not directly. Maybe through faith, indirectly, by having faith in what the prophecy said, they had in a way accepted his sacrifice, kind of like through proxy, through the prophecies. Um, they hadn't directly. And a lot of them probably hadn't at all. So I kind of jumped ahead and stopped reading what I was reading. But because one, he is referring primarily to the law. That's another point. And two, he doesn't mention his own sacrifice at all. So again, he's not talking about salvation at all. Not talking about his sacrifice at all, which brings salvation. He's talking about the law. So he's clarifying the law. He's not. He's saying, if you want to obey the law, this is what you must do. Give to him who asks you, and don't turn away from him who desires to borrow from you. Because it says up here, verse 17, Don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. So he's talking about the law. That's kind of an introduction. And then down here, it says... You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That comes from Exodus chapter 21, verse 24, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 20, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. Um, one of them might kind of directly say that, but the rest of them might be loose. Or maybe that's kind of just a loose, uh, a paraphrased version of what all of these verses are saying. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. In other words, this was a list of requirements for Jesus' hearers 
not if you have surrendered to God. So Jesus' hearers would include us because we're reading what he says, but he was talking directly to them, not to us. Of course, that doesn't mean there's no reason to read these verses. Some people might say, well, if he's just talking to them, then why should I even read it? Because they depict how God's children should be, even if our salvation doesn't hinge on it. So he's saying, if you want to obey the law, this is how you should be. Oops. This is how you should be. Um, but that doesn't, just because our salvation doesn't hinge on us doing this, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Because remember that the law is based off of God's, uh, God's view of righteousness. Uh, it's based on right and wrong, basically. So if we want to do what God wants us to do, then we will obey the law. In general, maybe not all the law as far as as far as uh, sacrificing and things like that, because Jesus was our sacrifice. But um, we will, in general, obey the law, because the law embodies um, right and wrong. And if we're God's children, we would want to do uh, the right thing. So, um, some would add that if we are God's children, this is how we will be, which is what I just said. Verses 31 and 32. Now, this is more specific. Um, what I was just saying there was kind of general. And I was just using that part that I came up to as an example of what I was talking about. Jesus seems to have viewed marriage as unbroken, even if a divorce certificate was given. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 12, Jesus gives more detail about this topic. He says, But I tell you that whoever puts away his wife, except for the cause of sexual immorality, makes her an adulteress. And whoever marries her when she is put away commits adultery. In the law... Um, they would give their wife a divorce certificate, a, a written um, kind of like a seal that they were divorced. It, it was um, kind of like how we get divorced today, how you can uh, go through the process. Um, but Jesus is saying that even if a man gives his wife a divorce certificate, if he puts her away, except or, or divorces her basically, except for the cause of sexual immorality, he makes her an adulteress. People have different views on that. I don't think I'm going to go over it, but, um, well, yeah, I won't go over it. But whoever marries her when she is put away commits adultery. So that's a pretty tough verse, especially um, for some people who may not have realized what this says. So it's, yeah, it's a tough verse. All right, so the next verse is uh, 33 through 37, which is here. Jesus seems to have viewed marriage as... No, I've heard people say before that Jesus was talking here about swearing flippantly, promising as if with something as collateral. In the culture Jesus lived in, this was a common event. He said, again, you have heard that it was said to them of old time, you shall not make false vows, but shall perform performed the Lord your vows. But I tell you, don't swear at all, neither by God, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall you swear by your head, for you can't make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. Whatever is more than these is of the evil one. Some people believe that you shouldn't swear at all, so you shouldn't say, I promise. Um, but like I said, I've heard people say before that Jesus was talking here about swearing flippantly. Um, in ancient times, or in, uh, in Jerusalem and uh, in Judea, um, the Jews used to, a lot of times, they would um, swear by something. In the culture Jesus lived in, this was a common event. They would swear by something. So, for example, they would say, I swear by heaven, that, dot, dot, dot. And Jesus is saying, don't swear by anything. He's not even just saying, don't make any promises. He's saying, um, don't swear at all, neither by heaven. And he gives all of these different examples of what people might swear by. Um, and his uh, reason is, for you can't make one hair white or black. And all these things you don't have control of, and in this example... It is the city of the great king. You don't want to 
in a sense, defile the city of God because you're swearing by it and then you can't live up to what you swore. So he's not even necessarily talking about just making a promise. He's talking about swearing by things. Um, but in general, I would say an application um, and what he basically meant is don't swear flippantly. Don't just, you know, say just if someone asks you a question don't just say i swear by dot 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 that um that this is true because people used to do that even in greek they used to say i swear by zeus and that meant i'm telling you the truth but you know so they didn't really mean what they were saying and it was it was a flippant um oath or uh swear they they swore flippantly basically all right, um, verses 38 through 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist him who is evil. But whoever strikes you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone sues you to take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and don't turn away from don't turn away him who desires to borrow from you. And I wrote, I'll be honest, I've struggled with these verses a lot. These are the only takeaway thoughts I have on them. So this is basically my thoughts concerning that. Verses 38 through 42, which would be that through here. 1. Because Jesus is referring to the law, the law depends on or hangs on love. That's from Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. And because of the close proximity of these verses, verses 38 through 42, which is what I just read, what it says in verse uh, to what it says in verses 43 through 47, Jesus probably meant for us to do these things in love because he's talking about the law and the law depends on or hangs on love, as he said in Matthew chapter 22, verses 33. 35 through 40, and because of the close proximity um, to verses 43 through 47. 43 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And 44 says, But I tell you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you. And then it continues. So this is talking about love. It's pretty clear, especially since the verse first command is love your enemies. And then bless those who curse you would be an act of love. Do good to those who hate you would be an act of love. Pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you would be an act of love. So because of um, these verses, if anyone sues you to take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Uh, these, The proximity of these verses to the other verses, and because this is still talking about the law, and Jesus said that the law is can be summed up in the love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, then I would say that this is also about love. That's my first point. Jesus probably meant for us to do these things in love, not just for the sake of doing them. If this is true, this means that Jesus didn't expect us to allow someone else to take our coat unless we think, or he says, or he, or he says to us, is what I mean, that there's a good reason for, for us to give someone else our coat or let someone else take our coat. Uh, for example, maybe it would soften their heart if we let them take our coat, or maybe it would be a witness to them of God's long-suffering, which means patience. Or maybe they needed it. Maybe they needed a coat. Um, so basically my point in saying this is, I don't think this verse... I don't think what Jesus is saying is, is I want you to let yourself get beat up all the time. But I do think that it has some connection to the idea of love. So a lot of people in persecuted countries, um, I won't say that they let themselves get beat up, but um, they do, they are patient in persecution. Um, and they're one of the reasons why they're patient is because of these verses. So, two, second point, the commands in verses 39 through 42 all involve someone already doing something to you, striking you, suing you, compelling you, and asking you. So, um, don't resist him who is evil, but whoever strikes you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. Whoever strikes you, that would be someone who already struck you, you wouldn't turn to him before he strikes you. If anyone sues you to take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Um, in Greek, it says, um, the one... 
desiring uh, you to take to judge. I don't know. I I can't read it super fast. Um, and the cloak and your cloak to take. Uh, wait, and your coat to take. Uh, release to him also your cloak, according to what it says here. So here it says the one desiring or um, the one who will. And so some verses it might sound like if anyone is going to take away, if anyone is going to sue you to take away your coat. Um, but even in this case, because it says uh, release to him also your coat or your cloak, I mean, because it says release to him also your cloak, then um, because it says also, then that kind of means that he already sued you. You wouldn't release also your cloak if he didn't sue you yet. That's just, I don't know. I mean, it, that could be argued against, but in general, these things are things that have already happened to you. Whoever compels you to go one mile, he already compelled you, go with him too. You're going an extra mile after he compelled you to go one mile. So it's not that you're preemptively letting people walk all over you it's after people have done things then you choose and you purposely um have it work even more and i believe it's to show love to show god's love give to him who asks you he's already asked you you give to him who asks you and you don't turn away him who desires to borrow from you now desires means uh doesn't necessarily mean that he already asked you but um if you want to if in order to know if he asked you or not he would have to ask you or in order to know if he desires to borrow from you he would have to ask you so you wouldn't oh well, i mean in general you wouldn't really know if he desires to um borrow from you or not unless he asks you so even this i would say um would be um something that happens afterwards so it's your response after something happens to you after someone asks you if they can borrow from you all right 43 through 47 says you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but i tell you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you that you may be children of your father who is in heaven for he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust for if you love those who love you, what what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? If you only greet your friends, what more do you do than others? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. This again is about love. We are supposed to love even those who hate us, which is hard to do. That's a pretty obvious statement, but it's true. 2. Jesus Jesus' use of the word Father when referring to God was what uh, was what other teachers, or rabbis is what they would call them in Hebrew, had done before. This doesn't show that Jesus was only talking to those who believed on him. So some people might think, because it says, therefore you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, then he's talking to Christians, because Christians are the only ones who have a Father uh, whose Father, who's, um, Christians are the only one who God is their Father. But um, actually, there was other rabbis before Jesus, I've read this, that have mentioned, uh, that called God in heaven um, his hearer's father. So this doesn't prove that he was talking to Christians. This just He was just talking to his hearers, and he was using the same uh, term as um, other rabbis have done in the past. If anyone thinks these verses aren't difficult to follow, maybe they haven't taken the time to try and understand what it's really saying. In verse 40, the coat would be a person's undergarment. The cloak would be a thicker outer garment that would keep them warm, even at night. So an example of these things would be Exodus chapter 22, verses 26 and 27, and Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 through 13. I'm just going to go to Exodus chapter 22, and I'm going to um, show you what it says. Because it was significant for Jesus to say, if he takes your coat, let him have your cloak also. 
If you take your neighbor's garment as collateral, you shall restore it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What would he sleep in? It will happen when he cries to me that I will hear, for I am gracious. Um, the cloak was what they would use to keep warm at night. So it would almost be like saying, if someone takes your clothes, give him your bed and your, or maybe not your bed, but at least your blankets also. What if it's cold at night? So that's why it's so significant what he was saying. He was saying, don't just let them take your clothes, or maybe not, if they sue you, you can't. You, maybe you don't really have a choice, but you can at least not put up a fight about it. But don't just put up a fight about them hurting you by taking your clothes, which was obviously something that was necessary for life in general, um, and it was difficult to make. Um, but also give them even more than that, which is your cloak, which will, I mean, what are you going to wear? What are you going to wear at night? For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What would he sleep in? Um, so Jesus was saying that if someone were to sue you and take your coat, you could give him, you should give him what's even more important, your cloak. All right, so that's it. Um, I apologize for this very long video. Um, I was afraid it would be kind of long, but thank you for watching, everyone. Um, I just want to say if you enjoy these videos, if you find them useful, um, if you even find my ramblings useful, then I, uh, I would like to ask you to, um, you could buy products at my store, you can donate at the store. Uh, currently there's one product, but I'm very, very, very close to putting a new product up on my store. Um, and uh, one of the one of the things that you can buy in that package that I'm going to put up is a uh, timeline of uh, uh, the genealogy from Adam to Jacob. And it's got a lot of detail. It's, um, in my opinion, is very, very interesting. Um, it, it has a lot of detail. I tried not to leave any information out that was in Genesis. Um, and I don't know. You should look at it. You should check it out. It's very interesting. So I, I suggest that you buy that if you are interested in uh, the genealogy information and understanding that. So, all right. Well, thank you for uh, watching this video, everyone. See you next time.